just because we met today. The, the message is so important that if we do not stand up and tell the story, we can come back and we have to lose the people that we love just because of the people that they love. So we have to be very conscious about it. There's so many things that I've learned in the past couple of weeks that I don't feel like are like so systems kind of failed at Tell them the story. Yeah, tell story. Like, you know, like, proper ways, correct. And they weren't educated. I mean, they, so when you think of pre uh, Germany 1933, uh, the homosexual community was thriving in, in Berlin. And then came paragraph 175 of the criminal code. 100,000 men became illegal. And then over five to 10,000 men were persecuted and put in prison. And some of those were, were extremely You know, you, you can't understand it. Hitler and the Nazi regime persecuted people because they were different than him. And how interesting can we learn today that message? Because if it was either your blood, goes to the Jewish faith, those individuals that loved someone, it wasn't the people that he wanted you to love. They could have curly hair, they could be robust, they could be mentally and physically infirm. So it was because you did not fit the mold of this individual. Yeah. Can you give me these happy parts for how Yeah, yeah. Well, we want to thank everybody for tuning in today. So we're, going to, we're here at the station with uh, the Auschwitz uh, exhibition talking about the Holocaust and bringing awareness to what took place so many years ago. But, you know, we want to make sure that you're, you're prepared for the conversation that we're going to have. It's going to be about, you know, taboo subjects. It's going to be about heartache and pain that took place. And so just giving you that forewarning of like what you should be uh, prepared for and what you should be witnessing. witness. Uh, we're going to do introductions. I'm uh, Wes with Casey Care, and I'm joined with uh, I'm Ace with Len Box, my pronouns are he, him. Um, and I'm actually picking up my start, I'm getting a bunch of Keep watching because it's going to be really good. I'm also joined by um, some very special and exciting. I'm never special. I'm George Buscello, President and CEO of Union Station. It's great to have both of you. And it's a real honor to reach out to our community, the homosexual community, and tell the story. It's still vitally important. So thank you for being the very first to be able to tell all of our communities how important this is. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. You know, we're going to jump right into it. Normally we play a game and we, you know, have these cards and we're laughing. But this is a somber moment. This is, you know, a point of reflection and an opportunity to learn in that space. And so, why is it important that this exhibit is here in the United You know, when you think of Union Station as the visual voice of our community, Right, Union Station now projects at World Series around the world, at Super Bowls, and we light up for LGBT and, and Gay Pride Month. Yes. We become the voice, and now this is the time, this is the place, and this is the story that we must tell our community to ensure that we can make a change and a difference, and ensure that what happened in Nazi Germany must never be forgotten and must never happen again. So this is the time, this is the place, this is the story. Um, um, yes, I'm gonna jump in and just ask, like, so, this exhibit is only in a couple of cities in the United States? That's a good question. This is the single largest exhibition we have ever known to. And what's really great, as I said, we're the visual voice. All the eyes of the world will be on Kansas City on Monday the 14th when we open this to the world. And when you think about it, um, this has been a five-year journey to bring it here. Uh, and to think for a moment, why like Kansas City? Um, we started five years ago when we met Luis, and you'll be able to speak to him a little bit later. And we had this idea about telling the story of the Holocaust. And it was just an idea. There was no exhibit. And we raised our hand and said, uh, we want to do this. Uh, our executive team, myself, and Jerry Baker, said, this is the story. And our board said, go out. So it opened in Madrid to over 600,000 and then it opened in New York City and then it comes to Kansas City and then it leaves and it has to go back to Poland. So this may be the last opportunity for individuals in, the, in America to see it. 
So this is the time, this is the place. 600,000 people in New York, that's No, it was only 200,000 in New York. 600,000 in Madrid. So we're going to crush New York. Oh, yeah. The heck in New York, we're going to win it. So five years in planning, um, like how did that, like, how did that fair posture? So is this like one of the first that we since COVID since? Uh, here, well, we were we were open uh, during COVID, and we made sure that the Grand Lady was open and welcoming people. But this is a, the biggest exhibition post COVID, and I will tell you right now, um, in a in, in a conservative, we would consider Midwest city to tell this story. Over seventy thousand people have already bought tickets to this exhibition. So we're going to crush New York, and we're going to tell the world that this community understands and appreciates and values what we want in this and what we need to tell. What's it? What's it like being a gatekeeper for all this information? To you know, to house it, to be the second city, and be the second city in the United States. Well, I'm a little bit upset that we weren't the first city, and we were going to be the first city, but somehow New York paid more money. That's so strange. But this place, this station, uh, what we've done over the last five years to encourage and convince the Polish government and the Polish Museum to bring it here, to encourage and understand and appreciate that it needed to be here, uh, was really a labor of love. And, and one, we're honored, but we're also humbled to tell the story. How we tell the story and how we make a difference in our community. This is um, truly transformational. So it's important, and, and it is the one where our team understands um, the importance of the story, and we are very humbled and honored to be able to share it with you. And Kansas City is embracing and understanding. And just think of. I'm hoping over 200,000 will see this exhibition. Our challenge is, is that I don't have enough days and hours, hours in the day to get as many people through that we really wanted to. With your next exhibition goes to the January. Right? Goes to January. Yeah. Well, there's still, you know, putting like time for people to get to the summer. Oh, oh sure. Like, I would, if I, I would encourage our our guests buy your tickets now to ensure that you have it for the fall. And if you don't buy them now for the holidays, forget it. Everybody's going to be out, COVID free, and we're going to be there. And everybody's going to want to come to Union Station for the holidays and experience the big exhibit. If you don't buy your ticket now, I can't guarantee you'll be there. So this is going to also be very immersive. I mean, I noticed when you walk around just our short walk through, there's a lot of like, tangible visual things, there's um, audio things, there's projectors, there's artifacts. Um, how many organizations, museums, people like came together from all over to be able to adjust from all of our Are there people about like donors, sponsors, and so on? Do you have a lot of like who's on the screen? Well, we spent a lot of time. There's over 700 artifacts in this exhibition from all over the world, from from Poland, from the from the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington D.C., and from private collections. People are going to see things that they have never seen before. We have Rudolf Hess's guess. Evil at its core. Cool. This is not a horror exhibition. It's not a horror story. The story is horrific. When you come, every object tells a story. Every object, it may just be a dish. It may be a child's shoe. Who was that child? Whose foot was in there? What is their story? So it tells you um, about the people. And our strategy and Luisa's strategy is to tell the story respectfully and leave something inside your soul in order that you can share that with others. Uh, donor community reached out. This is the most single most expensive exhibition. Well over $2 million to mount. To be able to, I want you to think the rail car, the rail car in front traveled over 6,000 miles to be in front of a station where troops left in the 40s to defeat Nazi Germany. And then at the same time, 75 years later, those individuals that have left this camp, that survived the displaced people, 
came to Union Station and walked on those doors. So when you come here, you go upstairs and you, for a moment, pause and think. Henry Bach left here to go defend America. And then Big Sonia came back and walked on those floors. So when you go down, walk on the Grand Hall, look up and really feel their emotion. And we're telling their story. They are living, breathing through us. So if you can imagine, Union Station, a rail car, World War I, Block Fountain, all at one time, one place to tell the story. It's more than an exhibition. How do you how do you market you know <laughs> an event like this? You know when it's somber and you want the things um, and it's very funny. Like marketing is always hard. And, you know, typically it's like you try to be upbeat and jovial and you know to make people feel welcome. And so how do you do that when it's something? It's like, also when there's so much like information and so much education. Like how do you? I mean, can you talk a little bit to like how do you walk through that educational piece of like someone bringing like you know their terminal pit and like. How do you explain to them like this is such a boring thing in our in our history and this is why this is important and also like do you do have like uh events as well? It's very <laughs> of course it's an emotional story. And if we are human and we are emotional, but our goal is to tell that story in the eyes and the artifacts of the experience. The viewer on the internet, yeah. social and digital yeah. media is vitally we launched this exhibition six months ago. As I told you, we're now so well over 70,000 tickets. We have a very detailed educational program with seminars, with the Center for Holocaust Education, where we'll be doing and telling the story of the LGBT community, Nazi Germany, those of the Jewish faith. We are opening it up and making sure that it's engaged. But it's not about when we did a single concert for International Holocaust Remembrance Day in January of this year, during the COVID, all we did was drop the banner of Auschwitz and had someone come and play music from Schindler's List with the violin, and we had, and it was powerful. I, I believe we have had over ten million engagements on this exhibition. And at any one time, we could have a million people engaging on this conversation, and it's a dialogue. And I can tell you, there very little hate. All I'm so proud of Kansas City for bringing this to this community. I'm so encouraged. So you asked a good question about how we tell students. We encourage this exhibition for those children over 12 years old. But it's a parent experience. If you believe your child is able to have that conversation under their well, um, we put together a great uh, education programs, and the donor community has reached out. Um, we've set up a program that we want to make this available. Some say, "Why are you charging money for this? You know, why isn't this free?" Well, Union Station is a not-for-profit. We get no state, federal, or local dollars. And if you were in my position, going before the board and saying, "I want to spend two million dollars that we don't have to bring a story about the Holocaust in Kansas City," I still have a job. But what our board did. Say yes, we want to mitigate those risks. And the donor communities come together. We're in the Bank of America Gallery. They said we want to be the first to support us. We've raised over $1.8 million to bring this exhibition to the community. So we're telling the story. But the money is going to change our community. For example, the donors came together and said, you know, we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to see this exhibition. So thanks to the Block Family Foundation. They have agreed to underwrite under certain needs. So if you're on the EBT, the food car program, you get to see this exhibition for $5. It's underwritten. If you're a student from seventh grade up to high school and your class wants to come in an underserved community, it's free. We've got donors that pay for that. So that is what's happening to this community. So I think, again, the visual voice, the grand lady is saying, I'm welcoming everyone in our community, and I want to encourage you. So that's what we're doing. What's something that you've learned, you know, after seeing this exhibition in place and 
I mean, I would think you two were different numerous times. The conversation, the conversation, all the time. I mean, breaking all the things together. What's something that, you know, that's, so like, you know, before that, you know, for like, shape the narrative before you went forward? Well, as I indicated, it's been a five year journey for myself and my other team members to create this. And sitting in a room in Atlanta five years ago, where we said, I got an idea, I want to do an exhibition on the Holocaust. And myself, my chief operating officer, Jerry Baker, went up to him and said, We believe you, and we want to be the first. Then that started a long journey with charrettes in Portugal and sharing ideas and us sharing ideas of what a touring exhibition should be. And then finally, going to Madrid and seeing it open to the world. I've seen it in Madrid, I've spent several times in New York City. I brought my children in New York to watch it. So, what have I learned? Every time I walk through the city, I see something different. And I'm hoping to be able to tell the story. When you go in, and we still talk about it, when we see how individuals were tagged, you know, with, with, with a pink triangle to tell them that's a homosexual, that's why this individual is in prison. When you walk through and then you turn around a corner and you see the story of Maximilian Colby, a saint, and Franciscan that said, I will put my life up, I will die to let this other person live, a Catholic story. And then imagine that that individual was beatified by a Polish pope. So those are the stories. And the stories about all of those of the Jewish faith, that what they went through, what they saw, just look at an eyeglass, and you see that and say, who were they? Why were those eyeglasses taken off this individual? Every piece brings a different emotion to you. And I walk through this over and over and over again, and each time there's a moment of pause and reflection. I may walk by the big, giant pictures, and then all of a sudden our amazing team that has done lighting design and theatrical design, all of a sudden they pop one face with a light, and all of a sudden that changes. You see the eyes of that individual. And then, I, I'm not going to tell you how this exhibition ends, because it ends very um, poignantly. And, uh, and when everyone comes here, if they've been to the Washington Holocaust Museum, they've been to any experience around the world, this is truly unique because the way Luis has created this exhibition it is about their people and their stories. And I hope that they will never be forgotten and we will always remember them. For their souls and their spirit now must be lived in us. It's our responsibility to see those faces, to see those artifacts, and now proselytize the story to make sure it doesn't happen again. We must never repeat history. And too many of our communities are all represented in this exhibition. When you come here, you will see yourself. But more importantly, you ask yourself, I could have been that individual. I could have been the person here. Just because of the color, just because of my nationality, just because of who I love. And, and what are we going to teach our people? And what are we going to teach our friends? And how can we ensure this is the quintessential DI conversation? Diversity and inclusion. Because now you can see what would happen the diversity and inclusion of the wall. And how they were Exactly. We have an example. And what, what better time than a Midwest city that has been affected by hatred in Johnson County, where three individuals lost their lives just because some person believed that they shouldn't be on this earth because of their religious background. What a sad comment. So now it's our opportunity to be able to tell that story and ensure that little kids and all children and all people stand up against this. So the exhibit runs from when the Tuesday? We open Monday on the 14th of June, and I'll tell you why that's so important. That is the first day that Polish prisoners were incarcerated in Auschwitz that then turns it into a persecution. 
Wow. So it's very poignant. And the head of the Polish Museum will be with us on that day. Not in Poland, where they typically have a very somber day. They will, he will be here. We will be broadcast live around the world. So you're just going to be asking us to beg for it on the We are doing the important thing to tell the story. I think you asked, you, 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 you articulated it very clearly. Um, this is one where we are reverent and we must ensure that we tell the story. Because it's our job to tell these individual stories and ensure that it never happens. We want to thank you for giving us the time to you know, learn from you about this exposition and to let everybody else know like how they can participate and where they can get their tickets and how they can be a part of this, uh, sharing this narrative and making sure that this doesn't happen again in our history. I hope everyone joins us, especially in our seminars that are coming up with the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. We'll have really very deep programming on Nazi persecution in the LGBT community homosexual men primarily, and, and you'll learn about uh, paragraph 175 in, in the German code. All of those things are understanding of our past, those that suffered so much to ensure that we're here and others are here, to live the lives and love the people that they want to be with. Thank you again for your assistance to be with us. It's a pleasure and honor, and thank you. Well, we want to thank you. Everyone for joining us. So we're going to be having our conversation with Luis now, who's going to be giving us a, a guided tour. But we're not going to do the full exposition. We're only going to touch on certain portions because we want you to have the opportunity to come and experience this for yourself and to see it in person and to really get that immersive experience with it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Luis to do an introduction and to start this process. With us. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. I viewers, I'm Luis Ferreira, the director of Auschwitz, not far away. And we are actually standing in a model that shows us a little bit the scope and the magnitude together with the map that we work of the operation of extermination. So probably most of you or some of you at least have been in Auschwitz. What happens usually is that when somebody goes to Auschwitz, the size of the camp help them understand the magnitude and scope of the extermination alone. However, that is actually a paradox because the Germans, the Nazis, did not need a lot of space to kill a lot of people. What happens is, in the case of Auschwitz, we have the three main elements of the universe of concentration camps. So basically, we have the slavery camps, so we have all these backgrounds where prisoners that were inmates were actually um, housed in, this, in, in these sections of the camp. Then we have the political countries, the concentration camp itself, and again, more, more backgrounds. But then we have the third element, which is extermination. And the truth is that the extermination camp itself, it's a very small area of the camp. It's actually uh, four buildings that we see in this model. I'm going to choose three, four, and five. And it was two camps. Exactly. So it's only in those places that actually are fenced, and in theory, they were secret operations within the camp, so therefore they should not have any kind of contact with the rest of the inmates, although in the end they did have. Basically, um, it, it, it helps us to understand actually that it's, it's this paradox. You don't need a lot of space to kill a lot of people. The problem they were facing, when this was speaking, was the disposal of the bodies. So basically also this, uh, this model also shows us the main narrative that people are going to follow in these pictures. So they will encounter the death of people, which only actually, and, and the railway is entering into the camp, only happens for, for four onwards before the camp for this selection point was actually outside of the camp. We have this selection point, so it's that, that, that space there between the buttons, and that is the place where this selection happened. And in one split second, usually a doctor, somebody who had, had a PhD and had learned, had promised to, to dedicate his life to help others and save lives, actually, was deciding whether you went left or right, life or death. Life, at least for a certain weeks. And all those people just go up, those selected to go directly into gas chambers, not considered to be fit to work, they would have to walk all the way through uh, to, to this section until they get to the crematorium to flee or cross to the Roma city camp and then get into the crematorium for a fight. And also of course this map, which in a way sometimes when we think of Auschwitz, 
we know that it's in the heart of the world and we think of one single spot. However, we have to understand that what the master was doing was combing the content to actually have the Jewish population and study. So we have up from north Oslo in Norway down to Salonika and south in Greece from the west, Dutch, touching the border with Spain to the east, almost in the Soviet Union, all of these rain, uh, rain tracks coming into rivers of black in a way and migrating into this dot the map which is country. And actually the void of this culture, of this diversity, is already is gone in Europe right now. So basically we have to understand that although Germany lost the war, Hitler committed suicide, when it comes to the other they were very near being completely successful. They were successful two thirds of the population before the war in, in Europe was stopped. But, uh, but this is something that helps us to understand again the scale uh, of the operation and also the country itself. You were you were speaking before. Basically, we were small cities, and and and, and the management of these uh, camps was also something very complex for the SS. And they had also a financial uh, perspective. So they were yes, that was basically making money out of, of, of every slave labor that was sent in the case of Auschwitz, for instance, to be in father, to uh, to basically be, be used as, as slaves for a each father was probably the the second, third, fourth largest company in the world at that time. Globally. So hopefully this this model and this map will help us a little bit to understand the scope of what they are doing when we speak about it. When it comes to you know talking about the reach of the Nazi regime, like bringing individuals from all across Europe to Germany, how are they able to convince these other nations to send those individuals to? One of the main points of the situation itself is for visitors to understand that actually genocide is a social act. The place must be one person or one group of people. You cannot have the genocide with, without using the past uh, complicity, whether active or passive, of society. When it comes to Germany, of course, there were different situations. There were many, many countries that they had conquered militarily, and therefore they established their some kind of regime where they could, uh, uh, where they could basically take the new population. But in some other cases, the perfectly the, perfect, the allies of the Germans were even willing, very, very willing to help them in terms of getting rid of their uh, Jewish population or other groups of, of people. So, do they consider like criminals or marginalized? In the case of Germany, basically, um, one could speak about the, when it comes to, to victim groups of victims, we could speak about behavior. There was one group of victims who was the behavior, so those that were homosexuals, those that were asocials, those that were for political behaviors, communists, trade unions, liberals, democrats. Uh, so all of those were considered to be enemies of the state. Then we can also have another group of victims which could be uh, described in the views of the Nazis as biologically inferior. Uh, and, and we'll be getting to this is the superhuman uh, concept and the ideological war against the Soviet Union. So Poles, uh, Eastern Soviet, of, of Soviet terms of war, of war, those were considered in this view of ideological uh, uh, inferior things. And then, of course, you have at the very core of the Nazi ideology the racism. So, of course, Jews uh, were the main target, but also Roma City, uh, also mentally and physically disabled people. The actual people were. Um, Inside Germany, these were Germans. Uh, German, German people. Yes, German people. Of course, Jews were also German people, but the actual, the, the Nazis started the pushing extermination of these mentally ill in 1944. Uh, actually, they, they killed uh, between 70 to 200,000 people, basically because they had some kind of mental illness and they, and they started using gas also in, in the action team for probes. So, you know, there is, of course, A.B. Sells it, like all Jews were Jews, uh, but not all people were Jews. Of course, in the extinction also, we have to deal with all these other groups of people. 
all the way here, not the extra package in order to choose. That is, so we choose that the main focus, I think probably the difference is that the, uh, the Nazis were focused very much in the in the Jews uh, population. And also, in the case of Judaism, of course, this, the Nazis did not prevent the Nazis. Yeah. Wow. I mean, we think about these things like Auschwitz was a death camp. When people who went there went to die, or going to slave labor. Were all camps set up like that? Were they all death camps? Or were no. they so that, all is what, that, that is what actually makes Auschwitz unique and why it's Auschwitz, among other reasons, because it seems to be hard to think that it's so important. That's it, those are. Uh, extermination camps. So these are very small camps because they don't have the ballot, they don't have the basically the heritage of the house. Correct. Everybody that went to those camps were basically sent to catch campers and they were, they, they were killed. In the case of Auschwitz, we have that element of the And that Auschwitz actually was not established as a camp for the extermination. Auschwitz was established in 1940, the final solution that's provided to Auschwitz in early 1942, the camp was conceived, was constructed basically to terrorize the Jewish uh, resistance, the Jewish civil political fear. Correct, and also when we speak about Auschwitz, in this case, we're talking about Auschwitz to Europe. People think of Auschwitz as one camp. It would be correct to say that it's a complex, one complex of camps. We have Auschwitz 1, we have Auschwitz 2, Europe now, we have Auschwitz 3, Monowitz. And we have for almost, I think it's almost 50 soup camps of, of different sites that were belonging to the complex of Auschwitz and under the heritage of the Auschwitz family. So, when it's, when you're trying to share that message, you know, part of this, you know, exhibition is like an educational tour. Like, what, uh, what steps are you taking to help the individuals learn that story? I mean, because you know, the pictures tell you know their own stories by themselves. We want to do that guided, and you, you can't do it with you know somebody walking with somebody and throughout this exhibit. Correct. So for us, it's very important the altitude because the altitude will guide every picture. It's always in the eyes, and it's going to guide through a voice, a music, and sound effects through a very complex scenario. We don't start the exhibit with an altitude. We have to go back up in time to understand and the Judaism of the Judaism, the different group of meetings, the ideological component in Nazism, how was Nazism able to reach the power. So we, we cannot we cannot understand how how we need to start telling, telling the story from the moment the camp was created in go back to that. This is why the exhibition is also so large. So we have the auditor that also gives us access to the testimonies of the survivors. So we try to tell whenever possible the, this story through their voice. And what we are doing is basically present the facts through the material evidence that we have, which are the artifacts and the pictures. And the testimonies. Yes, yeah, so it's the combination of the same original artifacts with the pictures, with the testimonies of survivors. It's all of that combination that hopefully we trust that we will be able then to make this person understand the underlying principle that makes it possible the system and the extermination process. So this uh George has spoken to you that this was a five year process and you had this idea of the meeting and you were like, I want to create an exposition. So what is it like seeing your idea turn into actual realization? Like seeing I mean it, it's always uh Emotional feeling also because the reason why I had the idea to do the exhibition was because my, my brother died of a sudden heart attack and I was given one year later this book, the film book called Man in Search of Meaning by Victor Frank. So he's a psychologist, uh, Austrian psychologist, who explains the psychological trick that, uh, that, that it meant for somebody to be sent into concentration camp. He was one of those who was sent into the concentration camp and specifically in Trout. So he narrates his, his, his experience in the camp. And by giving that camp is when I think things to do, I believe uh, there is this, this sense that you have to do something. Yeah. You have to do something. Now, we were working in a division, so of course, the natural thing was 
that student thinking about how to and try to explain, uh, you know, and try to touch people and try to, to make people understand what happened here. Because it's certainly looking back in history, which is very important, but it's hopefully it's also a call to action. It's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not probably just enough if we learn what happened, but we have to use that information to quickly analyze our own things. <coughs> and that is something that we still do. We don't, we, we basically, as I said before, we, we send the facts. We tell what we know, how we know it, and we use the evidence to um, To empower the, the viewer, the person who you know, is like doing the tour, to take that information on and do that next step, the next right thing, like what can I do to share the yes, I, I do. Yes, it doesn't help again. Absolutely, and, and that is a little bit to close the circle. You know, yeah. these samples are a little bit with, uh, I want to do something, and hopefully this will be a way to any people know the story and then uh, be able to also do something themselves. It doesn't matter if you are in a very bad position or you have not. I mean, if everybody, we want to solve their there, but they are and do something in the past and they can be to create a better present and future for all of us living in this world. Thank you. Let's uh let's take a moment and go and like, check out some other uh, sure. areas we want to talk about. Oh hey, you caught me prepping for prep. Prep yourself with prep. What a wonderful option to have to prevent you from HIV. You have Travada and Discovy for PrEP, a once daily medication that will help lower your chances of getting HIV through sex. An important thing to remember is while on this medication, you will need to get tested every three months to ensure you are HIV negative along with other labs. Sign up with the PrEP Navigator at KC Care today by clicking this link below and someone will be glad to PrEP you for PrEP. Within the weeks, um, can you explain a little bit um, this part of the exhibit and exactly where we're at? This right, so actually, what we have here is a section of an original outreach pre monolith environment. So, what we do is basically also go through the process of extermination. We have to remember that it depended on each transportation, but basically, around 75 80% of the people arriving in each transport. Uh, usually were directly sent to the gas chamber, so there's a tourism center. So that's seventy percent. Yeah, seventy or eighty, yeah. depending on, on the time. Um, and that was the determined end. like as they were unloaded. I mean, like from my understanding, is like there were just like doctors set up and literally giving a visual, not even touching, just like you gas chamber, you two. It was in a split second, usually an SS doctor who would decide in just a matter of seconds if you were able to. Uh, work in the camp. So it basically, sometimes there was absolutely no questions. And sometimes there was questions about age or what, uh, you know, what uh, work they would be able to do and so on. But basically, it was just uh, one second and then either right or left, meaning light. Or so, so, uh, so we deal with the process of determination, which is what happened for most of the Jewish prisoners that are sent to us. With. However, a small person that is considered fit to work and therefore is registering. So, of course, we deal with the process of the tattooing. We deal with the process of being shaped of all their bodies. We deal with the process of being registered in the parents and motivations being taken much into. And then, of course, what happens is that they get into the parents and life in the camp, if we can, if we can use this because of life, was, was horrible in terms of food, in terms of conditions of work, in terms of conditions of treatment in terms of temperature. Yeah. So, so basically we have to explain how was actually being uh, a few days, four months in outreach for the patients that were not selected to go to the gas chambers. So you said the prisoners that were selected to go, um, essentially even the ones that were selected to go, like their outcome was to go to the gas chamber. Eventually there was no like, you have to work here a week or two months or six months and then you're free or you move somewhere else. Like that just was the outcome. Correct. Especially in the case of the Jewish prison, basically the idea is that you were always going to that. In the case that they believed that physically they could still extract work for you from you for the German war effort, then they would do it and it would depend on the conditions of which squad work were you assigned in, which kind of barrack work were you, and your physical conditions, if you would last days, weeks, or months in some cases. What kind of work could we do? 
But basically, a lot of them were working for DG Farm, which was this huge flower land uh, that was very near actually where this flower comes from in Mon in Auschwitz Free uh, And others were doing all kinds of works in mines, in roads, in, and, and some, of course, we have testimonies. They basically say that their work was completely useless. Um, one of the survivors just tells us that they were told to move one rock to the from one place to the other, and then the other day they were taking the same rock from that other place to the initial place. So basically, it really, it really extended a lot. So in some terms of that, like they were basically given a busy work, but like that kind of like a form of torture, just to like prolong your life just because we hate you so much that we're just going to make you Absolutely. physically exhaust yourself, starve yourself, rehydrate yeah. yourself. Yeah. Like how this, you know, like mental and emotional anguish. Yes, and also we have to understand that the whole system created in the camps was built and thought to create this competition in a way for life. So any kind of solidarity, any kind of uh, being kind with another prisoner was in a way an act of resistance and an act, an act of dignity. But the whole system was thought to avoid that and to create this competition between prisoners. Emotionally, mentally, and turn you against even like your closest friend or family member that you would have been. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and, and that's why it's important also, and we show you in the tradition, we had examples of those kind of solidarity or spiritual uh, stamina or infiltration or revolts. So, we can actually see that there was also quite uh, many ways to resist and that some actually were able to, to, to go into that direction. And we, we show it with, with real artifacts and real stories. So um, what we're looking at right here is like a replica of what the camp would look like? Or no, no, no. This is actually an original section of how it's being on. So and of course, if you look from this window, uh, we can see the uniforms, which are of course again original. So, uh, so Understanding, we have seen a band before. We see, we speak uh, about the food conditions, as I mentioned before. So uh, we even speak about the orchestra and the music. And so it's, it's actually very surprising and a paradox that how such a place could have looked like an orchestra. So you have to go through all the uh, way the Nazis thought and, and how they wanted to use music also to have the working squads work uh, in a, in, 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 with a better rhythm and so on. Um, so understanding the inside universe of the camp is what we start to do with, uh, with this artifact, which is one of the largest we have in the exhibition. But again, we have very big artifacts and very small things. And, and I think that combination is what, what will give the visitor the understanding of what happened inside the camp. That immersive experience. Um, right behind me, what are some of these things? So in this room, actually, this is what we tend to call sometimes the archaeological So what we have explained before is actually what is the policy of the Nazi regime, especially in the case of the Jews. We just encountered before other groups of victims, so homosexual people, witnesses, political prisoners. Uh, and in this case, if we explain how the perpetrators behave, we need to also explain which were the reactions from the victims. So in this case, what we are looking at is Jews like in Nazi Germany, and what kind of, uh, of civil life they could organize. And of course, very important we have uh, with him, which was the first women order as a rabbi. Um, uh, um, with like the prisoners that are held captive as being like these old people, but the reality is it's like it wasn't just uh, these Nazi soldiers, like it was architects that were going with yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. it was doctors that were making those decisions, like it was all these people that were so complicit that like we don't talk about them, we don't okay. think about them. Sure. So, I mean, okay. like, like I don't know, like I really gave that question, like how to ask that question, like how does that, what does that look like in what, like, I don't know, like that. It, it's a little bit what we always say that somehow, and I think I explained this, that genocide is not, it's always a social act, yes. and you need the complicity of the cultural, academic, bureaucratic, economic, political elites. Otherwise, you cannot actually, it's not the presence of one person. I don't know if you want to maybe it, it, But that, but also to like, were these people, like, were all of these, you know, architects and doctors and people that were explicit, were they all German? Were they all, like, specifically, like, on the same, or were they doing it out of, like, fear for persecution themselves, or were they doing it because they really did have hate in their heart? Were they doing it because they were afraid, like... That's what they, <laughs> some of them, or said that they were forced to that they were just given orders. However, of course, uh, 
you know, and it's what you always find in terrorism you know, when, they, when it's been the case of Europe. I mean, then they basically they try to detach emotionally from the victim and they say it's not a personal thing. I don't, I don't target you because of the way you think, love, rape, whatever. It's just because you were an enemy to the to the state or to your political idea. Um, but of course, you know that falls down completely when you find just one example of somebody. As we say, I'm not going to do this, whatever is not or not. And there was a few examples. And also, it's interesting because it's uh, in many, many cases, um, you know, some people think that the Nazis who would reject this kind of policies would encounter, as you were saying, physical risk for their lives. But actually, that's not the, that's not the case. So I think um, complicity of the neighbors also is, is a very because these were their neighbors. I mean, uh, it was their doctor that they were killing, their uh, bookkeeper, their trade unionists. It was just, you know, a whole, whole section of society that they were taking out. So, do you have some people who know you can just like go home and have dinner with your kids yeah. and your wife yeah. and be like, I'm going to work tomorrow. And yeah. There was a big, you know, furnace that burned a bunch of humans that. That's probably one of the most terrible things to understand from this story is that the perpetrators were not coming from mobs. They were also human beings. And how could this happen in the part of Europe, in the part of the most technologically and culturally advanced society? Can we call a society that embraces genocide in which PhD people and, and doctors and designers and architects and saying become complicit in the genocide of their own neighbors. Can we call that education or educated people? Um, you know, that, that's a very interesting debate and unfortunately there's not a simple singular answer. There is a variety of reasons uh, and we hopefully in the exhibit we can raise all those questions and hopefully also the most important thing, the exhibit becomes in a way a tool to identify these signs that lead to certain roads, because we know where those roads end up, and we know uh, where they lead to. So hopefully we get the tools to understand how democracy can turn into a dictatorship, and how easily the dictatorship can turn into, uh, into governments committing genocides. So, very close to the So, um, I guess, Besides this huge um, piece of history, what other tangible pieces do you have? You said we have uniforms, we have... Well, we have 700 original artifacts in the exhibition, and, and most of them are from victims or from the site, as we have the poster for this section of battle. But we also deal with the perpetrators and with the psychology. So we have Hoss, which is who was many years in command of the house, that is working there. We have the boots. From the SS, we have uh, elements like whips. Uh, so we, we also focus on that and we try as much as possible to have a representation in terms of artifacts for all the different victims. Um, so basically, the exhibition is a very artifact driven experience. And at the same time, be able to understand the underlying principles that make the existence of the camp possible. Well, I want to thank you so much for letting us come here. Thank you for your time and explaining some of this. Um, I am very grateful that we all, I also got a couple of free tickets from it. Um, I'm really interested in uh, the art. That's going to be exceptionally helpful. Um, so I appreciate everything you've done. Thank you so very much. It's a pleasure for us also that you can spend the time to really uh, understand the market of the exhibition and speak to so many of your passing and work. So, uh, again, it's a pleasure. Thank you for helping us spread the story of how to Thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Ace from Unbox. I'm a real homosexual and I'm drunk here with uh, my co host. Uh, my name is Wes. I'm also a real life homosexual. We have a very special um, guest today. Um, would you introduce yourself? I am Shelley Klein from the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, and I am also a real life homosexual. Yay! Uh, so, can we just start first with, like, why are we saying homosexual? Hugs! Oh, hugs! hugs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, why are we saying homosexual? Because, you know, typically every time we say LGBTQ, or we say queer is an all-inclusive term. Yeah, so that's one of the difficulties of talking about this area of history, is that which terms do we use? Do we use the ones that were used at the time and now in 
current discourse are somewhat offensive, mm -hmm. uh, or do we use um, what people are sort of with today? So I think I try and do a mix of saying we are specifically referring to like Nazi policy, we use the terms of the day, uh, we are talking about the individuals who identify himself, uh, themselves, and talk about it in terms of people who understand why. So the Nazis would refer to people who had um, same sex attraction as homosexual. Um, and this is probably no surprise to people that at the time that was deemed something that was unnatural, perverse, um, and unwanted within the culture. However, um, this is something that sort of had been part of the discussion for at least the last six years within the culture was a discussion of human sexuality. And I think many people forget that there was this moment in German history um, where people were trying to think of sexuality in more open Terms of the Nazis were erased a lot of the progress that was made in the 20th century. So, where are we at right now? In the exhibit, you know, there's a lot of artifacts that are available to you know, give presents to what's in place. So, we are standing in the section of the exhibit that deals with other victims. Uh, and this is a section that deals with Roma. Since you victims, sometimes again, it's a language issue. This is in the times of the day they get referred to these people as gypsies, which is now in the water's root, for example, from the city. In the same section, we see um, political prisoners, Jehovah's Witnesses, and of course, we're standing in front of the section that also deals with victims of the new If you could call it a section, it's too big. Yeah, the, the <laughs> section is, yeah, it's really small. Why, why is that? Why, why is there such a limited number of uh, artifacts? So, First, you have to think about terms of like numbers of victims. Groups. So, in terms of how many people were targeted, it will be less than say nine and a half million Jews across Europe. Um, that said, it's also deals with all the erasure that we see happening from the people who are victims of this time. So, you may have expected in an exhibit like this to see an actual big trial. Yeah. Um, yes. And I think a lot of people would be excited to see that sort of uh, um, you know authentic artifact. The sad truth is, we have very few of those left in the existence. Um, the museum in Washington, D.C. has at least one, they may have a couple now, but after the quarter, unlike a lot of other things we that you see here, you can see all the different categories of prisoners. Many people may have held on to their badges, or just not made a point to support the winning. Um, but because the category of being convicted for being homosexual is not something that way after the war, people who did have that categorization would have wanted to get rid of any documentation that identified them as such. Because under the penal code, they continued the post war world, they could have been pre And so many people hid those documents, destroyed those documents. So it wasn't really until the 1990s that curators began to find a few of these artifacts. Um, it's interesting that the DC Museum was being put together, they didn't even, until they found this one big triangle with one man that kept for years, and he had actually passed away, and it was his partner who had this box of stuff. And he said, I hadn't even gone through it until this period was shut out. And he went through it and found that yes, there was a big triangle in there. And the curator said, We didn't even know what color to make the pigment in reproductions because we didn't have an actual example. So I think that really speaks to rarity these artifacts and the continued persecution of people felt the people who were doing. Yeah, I think it's important to, to highlight that you know, the Holocaust ended, but the persecution for homosexuals, queer individuals, continued. Yeah, absolutely. And not only did it continue so that there was that further persecution, it stripped away the historical history. And I think even when we're talking about, I think about like layers of erasure. So we have, even when we talk about the triangle, we're still erasing the other. We were called queer victims that were caught up in this event. So even though gay um, women, lesbians, trans, non binary people wouldn't have been picked up under paragraph 175 in the big triangle, they still were, their lives were disrupted, um, communities were destroyed, persecuted. persecution happened in different ways, but they wouldn't have been identified under the big triangle. So even when you know, we reclaim the big triangle and talk about victims of the big triangle, we're still missing all of these other individuals. Suffer this problem, and we don't have any records of them uh, because they weren't. If they were taking the camps, they would have been under the asocial category, and there would have been no official documentation saying why they were there for that reason. So, asocial would just sort of be like a, kind of like a catch-all, like 
uh, a category of uh, what they think they really, they didn't really want to break it because there was maybe too many. Yeah, this just refers to anyone who was in the German Nazi group. This could be people who uh, maybe they lived in a workshop or they may have been in a workshop. I think I feel unimportant. They couldn't hold a job. Yeah. And this could be like for maybe mental health reasons. Like we don't know. They were just like sort of on the outskirts of society. Maybe they were homeless. Um, maybe they you know, could have been for gender reasons. So there's lots of different reasons that a person can be sexual. So, but you're right, it is a catch on. People could easily say, oh, if you're a mixed person. 175, 175. So I think 175 was, it was a few months before Nazi Germany, and throughout Nazi Germany they altered it to make it more aggressive. Yes, so the penal code 175 was back in European history, but specifically to 1871, the Russian code. And basically it outlawed sexual acts between men. But it had the lyrics were not said unnatural sexual acts. And so it was interpreted very narrowly to be intercourse. And it meant that you had to basically be caught. So it was really difficult, and most people didn't pursue it. It's on the books, but it wasn't that active pursuit. A few hundred people were convicted in the course of the year under 175 prior to the Nazis' change. So in 1934, they were just saying, you know, to do it in 1935, they eventually changed paragraph 175 to be more expansive. So it would be any kind of sexual acts between men, um, which meant it could be holding hands, a glance, asking someone out. It was really a broad So they could apply it in all kinds of departments. And it also meant that it was much easier to the So under the previous law, you couldn't just say, hey, I think this, you know, I suspect there's two men in a relationship together. That would you could if you're not a Nazi regime, basically like anybody could like have fire gossip. Yes, gossip could definitely get him sent. And in fact a lot of men they were, but that's how they were picked up. It was because they were denounced by a neighbor. And then we think too, some of these were some of these were men who you know would identify that way. Some of them weren't their neighbors just didn't like them or they had some sort of other few. Um, in some cases, too, we have to think about how the Nazis are identified. So, under 175, when the Nazis change it, um, this also meant that, and there were, you know, the people that were you know, assigned male at birth and identified as female. They wouldn't have considered themselves to be engaging in same sex sexual activities, but the Nazis, of course, would. And so, the women in which was prosecuted for that as well. And I should say, under this law, uh, there's a very noticeable omission here. Now when the Austrians draw their law, because they have a similar 175 the Austrian version, and they include it as well, the Germans are there. And they do include a simulation to prosecute them, essentially. So there is some less gain inclusion of that in Austria, but it's very in Germany itself. They didn't really know how to define this component. So while well, they thought it would be much easier to Capture men, and decide that holding hands that, that qualifies, but they they really iffy on how they could decide what qualified the same sex activity. What's really important about all of this, and a huge difference from our government time and country, there's absolutely no religious basis for why the Nazis are into persecuting sexual activity, and specifically why they're into persecuting male homosexuality. They believe it's a pure answer. No, it's just not pure hate. It's pure hate. It's hate, but it's not like, again, there's like Christian religiously based. They have like a, some moral judgment that they place on it or something. It's like about that. threatening the racial community. So think too about 1935, when they this law, it's the same year that they do the Nuremberg Laws, which is a nice section of the that they open up the Nuremberg Laws, um, which prohibits sexual activity between Jews and non Jews. So what they're trying to do is set up a racial community, and you see this filter through other ways. They want to have first sterilization of people who they deem not worthy of reducing. Uh, these are cultures of degree, but there is an Asian program where they call up murdered people who they deem as being detrimental to the So what they're really about in the 30s is rebuilding the population and based on the social community. So they consider men who engage in sexual acts and men is not reproducing their body. So, if you would interact as a threat to a virtual community, in 1936, he mm-hmm. sets up an office called um, the Office to Combat Homosexuality and Abortion. Because oh, right. all, yeah. It's like when they just tag in uh-huh. abortion. Like, yeah, it's just, you'd be like, oh, this seems like a religious thing. 
No, it's absolutely about reproduction. Because they want to make sure that the women aren't having abortions they shouldn't, because they need those kids for a lot of And this is why women were not included in that as much, because they thought, well, we can just force these instead of reproducing our babies. That's okay. They're not, they're not threatening the racial state. They can still be the names for that's very misogynistic and that patriarchy that women are property to be owned and being subjugated. So regardless of how they are. Yes, and it also really bring back this idea of biological destiny. But like women are wanted because they reproduce. And it's also assuming that all women are identifying as women. All women, you know, can and want to, to reproduce. And this is specifically reproducing for the sake and homosexuals engaged in same sex can't reproduce. So they weren't beneficial for the German society. Yes, and not only that beneficial, they're, they're sort of, they were sort of worried there was going to be like an epidemic of homosexuality that spread. And all, these, all these men were like, no more ladies and reproduce it. And then that was like, there was the women, they were like, no. Like, it's, you know, that's, uh, you know, like pulling those parallels and linking it to present day, you know, that's what you hear from. Individuals from America talking about gays and lesbians and transgender individuals that they'll convince other people to be gay or that children being around them will turn gay because they've been around somebody who's gay and yeah. or who identifies as queer yeah. and well, some sort of money in our government bond we're still trying to dictate women's reproductive rights. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a good reminder that a lot of these, even if we see the different iterations and Obviously, we are not not security, but when we think about how rights can so easily be taken away, um, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Like, can we let's continue this conversation? Like, I want to talk more about that. Let's, yes. let's do it. You know, we sit down. Like, yes, yes. Conversation. Do yeah. So like, to die. Yeah, and I'd like to talk a little bit about how what things look like in Weimar because it's like such a function of their culture, and that's the yeah. most. And then we just think about, oh, the Nazis ain't so gay, but we don't think about, like, those who might be violent, or maybe it's like the most like, Yeah, um, it's like, um, I don't know, like, the first social game, yeah. It was, yeah, and not only did they... That's a waste of effort. So most people must have had a way of saying, yeah, we'll see how we're at some point, 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 we'll see how we're at